first time when I was in uh, Singapore was in, was in June 96, 99, no, 69. 69. And that was not the same Singapore as I see today. I was here also two years ago when we had the same summit. I've been, we've been listening to a lot of wonderful stories about what's happening in big cities and cities in developing countries and the cities that have been changing from industrial cities to knowledge-based cities. And I will try to tell you the story of my city, Malmö. Uh, the city of Malmö, uh, this is a picture of the city of Malmö first, but let me start with this. Where is the city of Malmö located? It's located in the southern part of Sweden. Sweden is in the sub-Arctic part of Europe, quite cold in the winter and quite uh, warm in the summer. We believe it's warm anyhow, but it's not like here, like here in, in Singapore, of course. Uh, the history of our, of, let me also tell like, like this, we are talking about the big cities, but you know in Europe, the vast majority of the people are living in cities between 200,000 and 500,000 people. That is the place where most of the people are living, and I believe it's like that in most parts of, of the world. So what we are doing in these mid middle-sized cities, I think, is very important for the future. And I'm trying to tell you what we have been doing, not the plans of what we are, because then I could talk about the smart grids and like that, but I'm talking about what we really have done in the city. This is the history of our city. This is a place where all the working-class heroes worked the Kokum shipyard, one of the best shipyards in the world, from our point of view anyhow. And 6,500 people were working here on, on this shipyard. But uh, this is the way it looked in the mid of the 90s. Here we have the world's biggest crane, 131 meters of height, the symbol of the industrial city. And uh, that was taken down. Here you can see the retired workers staying, looking at the, on the ship where they put all that big crane on board of that ship. And that crane was uh, taken away from Sweden, from Malmö, with a mighty servant number three. And today that crane stands in the world's biggest shipyard in Ulsan in South Korea. And it's painted red and it's Hyundai, it's written on it. So it stands on the right place anyhow. But uh, after that crane went away, we just had this area, the former shipyard area, close to the city center, one million square meters polluted. And uh, now you should look upon, uh, there we have the pointer, and how it works, oh, never know. Oh, there it is. Oh, it doesn't, look there, you can see there is a parking place at the left side of it, that parking plot, we started to think, what are we going to do when we have finished the building of the bridge between Malmö and Copenhagen? I will not repeat what Pia already said about building a two national region, showing that the national borders don't count anymore, that the cities and the city regions are the most important players for the future. So what are we going to do when the bridge is, is finished and the city of Malmö had 22% unemployment rate. At that time, um, Copenhagen had 16% in the mid of the 90s. So we were very bad off at that time. And you know, 92, we had the Rio summit, and that was about sustainability. So the future lays in a more sustainable society. That's about energy, that's about climate change, that's about biodiversity, that's about uh, sustainability from economic, social and environmental point of view. So that was a challenge. And we said, with the best of, of, uh, of uh, experience from scientists, from environmental scientists, we want to show that it's possible to change a filthy brownfield area into a completely sustainable society. That was the challenge for us, and that's what we then started to. And here you see the first part of it, where we had the parking plot. There we built the first housing exhibition in European Union. That was completed the year 2001 with 500 flats. And what's special with this is, that's carbon dioxide neutral. This area is 100% fueled by locally produced renewable energy. That was the first time that that was made in Europe. We got all the rewards from that, of course, the future, the city of tomorrow and like that. 
And this is the way the houses look, the 500 flats. And you can see there a channel also. That's a channel that uh, is because of the biodiversity, of course. But I continue. This is the solutions. In the summer, we take the summer heat, you know, one hour of inflow from energy from the sun is equivalent with all the seven billion people are using during one year. One hour's inflow of sun is equivalent. Most goes, of course, to the photosynthesis and things like that. But anyhow, sun is the most important part. So, in the summer, collect the summer heat on, on, solar, on, on these solar panels, on the roofs and on, and on the walls. Pump that heat water down into the aquifer, 70 meters below in the cracked lime, limestone. That works like the thermos bottle. There we preserve this warm summer water. And in the winter, we pump up that and use electricity from the, from the wind generator, and then we use that for district heating for all the houses. And in the winter, we pump down that cold winter water. You saw the, how it was in bathing in Copenhagen in the winter. That cold winter water, we pump down in the cold wells in the, in the aquifer. And in the summer, we pump up that cold water and use that for district cooling. So in that way, we don't use any AC for cooling in the, in the houses or warming in the houses. And that gives us a very good energy balance for the houses, of course. And uh, you can see that we got a new icon also for the city. Instead of the big crane, now we have the Santiago Calatrava building, a sustainable building, the new icon for, the, for our city. Of course, it's a very small building compared with what we see here in Singapore, but we believe quite big, you know, in, from our point of view. And of course, also, we created a wonderful place where you can go swimming. This water here in the Ura Sound is so clean so you can drink it. It doesn't taste so good because it's calcium in it, but you can catch salmon here. So it's completely no uh, E. coli bacteria and things like that in the water. And of course, we continued with uh, wind generator. This wind generator park that we have outside Malmö is the third biggest today in the world. When we built it, it was the second build biggest. It's created about 150 megawatt, enough for 70,000 houses to, to power them with electricity. And of course, we have this uh, photovoltaic and these fancy things. You know, it's still quite expensive. We put them on retrofit buildings and like that. Now I come to the next challenge, and that is the next challenge. Everybody has been talking about the waste. You know, this place, nobody wants to have it in the backyard. And the poisonous uh, water goes down into the groundwater and, and destroys our drinking water. And it's only loved by seagulls and rats, you know. This is a source of, of uh, materials, of energy, of possibilities. That was what we said. Can we use that in a much clever way? So, of course, it's about, uh, now we see like that. Of course, you are taking away the glass, the plastic, the metal, the batteries, the chemicals, and all that thing are separated. But then we are separating the organic waste from the combustible waste. And in that way, doing that, then we can use and reuse, reduce them and reuse, recycle, and regain energy out of it. And look what's happening with the landfill. The year 2000, then we have been working a little on that, then 50% of our waste went to landfill. 2011, 2.4%, and today less than 2% of all the waste goes to landfill. All the rest is reused, recycled, and regained energy out of it. And of course, we get quite a lot of energy. It's about 10% of our need of electricity and 60% of all the heat waters. You know, 98% of all our houses are connected to district heating. So this is the most important way that we, that we heat our houses during the winter time. And of course, everybody's afraid of dioxin and things. There comes no dioxin out of this. And you can see with the best of clearance where you use all Again, the scientists, how to handle it. You can see that, that the results that is coming out is from one-fifth to one-thirtieth of what is permis the permission is from the European Union. So, and that is very, very high level they put out. And it's money in it. Before we use the waste, you can see that the energy is equivalent with 173 cubic meters of oil. That we burned before. Before that, we had coal. 173 cubic meters of oil, that's five times that is a barrel. And a barrel costs between 80 and 110 dollars. That means that we every year has to pay between 70 and 100 million dollars a year 
to get that energy that we are using from, from the waste today. And of course, with that we create quite a lot of, of jobs instead. And of course, the organic waste, that goes to a digester where it's fermentized, and there we get the biogas out of it. And of course, the biogas we are using, all our city buses, we changed from diesel to gas 1997. And in the beginning, it was fossil gas. Today, half of that gas is biogas that we are producing ourselves from the waste. In five years, all will be reused from the biogas that we are producing by ourselves to drive the buses. And of course, biking is very important. You see that 40% are biking in Malmö. I'm biking to the job every day, of course. I can't understand why people are using the car for a short distance, go home and change dresses and sit in the gym biking without any reason. It's much better to go biking to the job instead. <laughs> and of course, biking tracks. There's, there's something wrong with this. It says 425 kilometers of biking paths. In fact, we have 470 kilometers of biking paths. It's a little, uh, some years old, this, this picture. And of course, you can see that uh, the nurseries, when they are out with the kids, they are biking, of course. That is making mobility work. And of course, we are changing. This was many years ago. We changed a street that was made for cars, made it that to a biking path instead. Then, of course, you heard the song from Bob Dylan from 1960s, A Hard Rain Is Gonna Fall. And that hard rain is falling today. And that means that we have a lot of flooding and things like that. So what we are doing, we are separating the storm water from the, the, the wastewater. And of course, using the green roofs to make the water come down slowly. And then it goes into these ponds that we have like that. Very beautiful ponds, butterflies, water salamanders, frogs, lots of lives just in the, in the middle of the houses, creating biodiversity. And bigger ponds like that where it gets together so we never have any flooding, how much water it ever comes down. And like this is a retrofit council housing area where we build, made these ponds with the storm water instead. And of course, what we have been doing that the business sector, the private sector, is repeating also. This is a new factory built in Malmö. They are showing in their catalogue where I took this picture. Look, we are using the aquifer storage. We are district cooling and district heating our, our factory. And this is the way we are lowering the energy consumption here, from 250 kilowatt hours per year, square meter a year down to about 40. And the reduction of, of the emission you can see here. You see the dust almost down to zero, the volatile uh, organic compound down to zero, the sulfur dioxide, the NOx, the CO2, er everything is almost down to zero when you're using the right technique, of course. And IKEA, you know that the Swedish company IKEA, they have 17 uh, storehouses in Sweden. They, last week, they invested in 50 new wind generators up in north of Sweden. So the 17 storehouses they have in Sweden all should be supplied by electricity made by, from, from wind generators. And uh, they still have something to do. They have 294 storehouses all over the world and 650,000 um, customers visit them every year. So they have a little more to do. But you can see, they want to show up. They are environmentally friendly. And that is hopeful for, for, for the future, of course. And of course, you see how proud we are when we get the, the prize that we were the growth engine, the growth city 2009. 50,000 new jobs in a period of 10 years created. Create, creative jobs, green jobs, and at the same year, we got the UN Scroll of Honor for, for the holistic approach of becoming the 21st century eco town. So that means that investing in clean environment and clean technology and sustainability is not contradictory with, with creating new jobs. And here are the goals for our city. More efficient energy consumption, 20% less by the year 2020, another 20% less to 2030. And of course, reduction of greenhouse gases, 40% re reduction from nine, 990, so we, we must exceed, of course, the Kyoto Protocol. I'm the part of the Convenant of Mayors, where we said that we must exceed the Kyoto Protocol, of course. And Sweden's most climate-friendly city by the year 2020. The municipal operations should be, of course, uh, cli climate neutral 2020 and all the city 2030. So to wrap it up, this is 25 years ago. The Western Harbour, too, and this is about 15 years ago. 
And this is about two, three years ago. Now there's about 8,000 people working here, not 6,500 uh, these of, uh, steel workers, but now they are working in 230, 240 different uh, companies. That was the story that I wanted to tell you. And this, thank you for your kind attention. And uh, thank you once more for, for giving us the possibility to come here to hear about all the wonderful stories from the other cities here in Singapore. Thank you a lot.